It's 10.30 on the 21st of June, and two days later than planned, Westminster is all set to hear the Queen's speech in one of the most uncertain periods in British politics for decades. My Lords, pray be seated. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, in the light of the terrorist attacks in Manchester and London, my government's counter-terrorism strategy will be reviewed to ensure that the police and security services have all the powers they need to keep the population safe. Welcome to Show Don't Tell. Today we're going to follow the journey of a bill that became law very recently, the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Act of 2019. In this video, I'll try and give a real understanding of the decisions, debate and process behind an Act of Parliament and how your elected representatives go through the process of creating the laws that apply to our daily lives. There are 12 steps before a draft act of parliament called a bill becomes a law. But fear not, I did not produce some tedious summary of every single stage. We're going to talk real decisions that make law. As a result, only six of these stages have any real substance and the rest we can ignore. If you ever try reading the raw text of a bill, you'll discover it's fairly incomprehensible. Here we have clause 3 of the proposed bill, and it's just a list of insertions of text into existing legislation without any context or explanation. This is because new legislation requires new acts of parliament, but we also want our laws to be logically grouped. So as a result, the Counterterrorism and Border Security Bill will amend 11 previous acts of parliament that relate to terrorism rather than being a standalone piece of legislation. So how do we find out what it all means? If you're an independent member of parliament, you could vote freely on this bill and you don't have the resources to research everything from scratch. And every member of the public should also be able to understand what legislation is being proposed. The best source as ever is the House of Commons Library, whose reports are available on the Parliament website. They issue a briefing note for every single stage of legislation and provide history, statistics and links to further information. The primary supplemental resource for a bill are the explanatory notes, which explain the logic and effect of every single clause in some detail. If you want more purely legislative detail, you can read the Keeling Schedules. These are full expansions of the existing legislation, including proposed amendments, so you can read exactly how existing legislation will be changed by a new bill. Now, the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Bill was 84 pages long, with 26 clauses and 4 supplemental schedules, so rather than go through it all, we'll focus on the journey of Clause 3 that I showed earlier, which was probably the most publicly known and controversial clause of the bill. The effect of Clause 3 is detailed in the explanatory notes. The clause will criminalise online viewing of information useful to a person committing or preparing an act of terrorism if done more than three times, a whole new meaning to the phrase risky click. The Keeling Schedule gives the full Section 58 of the Terrorism Act 2000, which this clause will amend from its current version. The original Section 58 was written in the year 2000, and the language only criminalised downloading because the law never envisaged streaming, so that prohibition is going to be added by Clause 3 of the legislation. 
As you can also see, in paragraph 3 there is a reasonable excuse defence available in the existing legislation, and arguments about whether to leave reasonable excuse to the discretion of the courts as currently written, or whether to mandate certain examples, are going to be key elements of the debate. So with that, let's don the grey suit and enter the smoke-filled room where the government decisions are made. You see, second reading will be an all or nothing vote on the bill, and decisions are final in bill debates. In effect, if Parliament votes for something contained in a bill, it's almost impossible to amend it out later. The consequence is that you want to go safe with your second reading bill. At this point, the bill is a baseline, a solid framework you can amend later. You don't want to propose the most controversial stuff in the second reading bill, because people might rally to oppose a single clause given they can't remove it later, and if you lose second reading, you lose the entire bill. However, there are many later stages to court controversy through amendments. Lose the vote on an amendment, well, that's too bad, but you already have the baseline proposal in the bill, and the whole bill keeps moving forwards. So as we go into second reading a debate, which is a general debate on the bill, you'll discover your parliamentary colleagues will start offering many of their own suggestions about what should be included in future amendments to the bill, or pose questions about the clauses already there, because they too see the bill as a framework to be amended. So would this apply, for example, if I stream or look at, on YouTube at a national action video in the action that the select committee has been taking in order to try and get that video removed, if we watch it in the process of pursuing and pressurising YouTube to get it taken down, does that mean we are guilty of a criminal offence if we watch it more than three times. Why has he decided not to include the Australian scheme, the declared areas offence, whereby Australia deemed it illegal to travel to certain designated terror hotspots like Iraq and Syria? But I would say quite seriously to the Home Secretary that he also needs to look at what more could be done about guarding against radicalisation in prison? I want to comment first on the, the, the potential for the prison system to add to that radicalisation. So at the end of this four hours of debate, the Speaker calls for a vote. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as I've got opinion say aye. Aye. the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The opposition doesn't object, so the whole bill as currently written passed unanimously at second reading, which means our next journey is to climb the stairs to the Public Bill Committee, which is perhaps not the most glorious phase of the process for most MPs. I've never sat on a bill committee, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd be delighted to do so. Uh, I'm delighted to get involved in some of these issues. Anyone that has sat on a bill committee tells me I'm mad, uh, and that that would be the worst thing uh, to put yourself forward for. Public bill committee is like a miniature version of the House of Commons, but with just 19 MPs as members and two MPs who act as neutral co-chairs. The bill committee heard from witnesses, and then over a period of about a month, debated twice a week for about six hours each day, ploughing through the bill clause by clause. This is the first opportunity to table amendments, though only by members of the bill committee and usually just the opposition. Each clause and its associated amendments are debated in the order they appear on the bill from page 1 to page 84, and provides an opportunity for every clause to be debated in granular detail. The amendments tabled for our own Clause 3 are shown here in red. For instance, that the three clicks have to be within a 12-month period, that viewing must be combined with intent to provide assistance, and expands on what is considered a reasonable defence. So with that, let's look at a brief excerpt of the opening and closing statements for the debates that occurred on Clause 3 and its various amendments. 
The Clause 3 and the aims of Clause 3 are supported by the opposition, as I made clear at second reading with regard to this bill. However, that then comes with two uh, major further points. The first is that the new, the Clause 3, the updated offence, has to be workable from a practical perspective, because if it isn't, that clearly is a problem. Secondly, what it should not do is to bring into our criminal law those who are carrying out perfectly legitimate activity. So how it is drawn is also extremely important. And it is with those two factors in mind <coughs> that I put forward these five amendments. Uh, as I said, in the spirit of, of what I said from the very start with this bill, and as I have done with the Criminal Finance Act, which previously went to that, I'm determined that we collectively try and get to a, a, a place on this uh, that will help our law enforcement intelligence services meet their need, but also reflect uh, the very real concerns that have been raised on this point. I'm very grateful to the Minister for that answer and indeed the constructive discussions that he facilitated uh, with me yesterday. I think that it is very important that we work constructively to get this clause absolutely right. I welcome the Minister's approach both in terms of uh, not sticking to the three clicks uh, approach, which in fairness the Minister himself had already expressed reservations about at an earlier stage. Uh, on that basis, Chair, I'm happy not to press any of the amendments at this stage, and I look forward to what the Minister brings forward at the report. So, Clause 3 amendments were all withdrawn. Their value was actually in stimulating the discussion and forcing a government response, and this way they can still be introduced later on in Parliament or actually adopted by the government. So why is the Public Bill Committee loathed by so many MPs? Well, as you can see, many people sitting in this room are doing other work because they are trapped in this room 12 hours a week and they are not even pretending to listen. Nine MPs on this committee didn't make a single contribution at any point during the month the Public Bill Committee sat. Why am I even over here? You were just meet in the room, Simon. Yeah. Meet in the room? Yeah. For fuck. So after the bill has concluded the bill committee process, it comes back to the main chamber, where now anyone can table an amendment and anyone can contribute to the debate. And this is where things will heat up. Now the government will start tabling its own amendments usually to harshen up the bill and extend its powers. In this case, the government tables an entirely new clause to create the designated areas offence, making it illegal for UK citizens to travel to certain hotspots, which wasn't in the bill originally, nor has been subject to any debate so far. On Clause 3, government amendments now eliminate the three clicks qualification. It's now just one single click. However, the reasonable excuse defence has been expanded to include ignorance. If you didn't know you were about to view illegal material, that is an acceptable defence. It's during the report stage of the bill we start seeing whipped votes and divisions on both government and opposition amendments. And for our amendments to Clause 3... With leave of the House, I will put the question on the Government's amendments to be considered at this time. Amendments 1 to 5, 15 to 18. Minister to move formally. Formally. The question is that Government amendments 1 to 5, 15 to 18 be made. Does many of that opinion say aye? Aye! The contrary, no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. Ultimately, all of the Government amendments passed at report stage. Third reading then occurs immediately after report and is another all or nothing vote, but in reality a ceremonial one hour reminisce about the bill. But now, having concluded its journey in the Commons, the bill is tied in a green ribbon, walked through Central Lobby and presented to the House of Lords. <laughs> The bill process in the House of Lords mirrors that of the Commons, however in the Lords first and second readings are formalities, as for a government bill and unlike in the Commons, 
there is no vote called at second reading. The Lords Committee stage is substantive, but the Lords don't sit as a separate committee. Rather, they sit in the main chamber in a committee of the whole House. Now let's have a look at the Lords Amendments proposed at the committee stage. I've put these amendments in blue and left in red those that came from the House of Commons. The amendments are very similar to that of the Commons Committee, qualifiers that access as part of a pattern of behaviour and intent to use the material for terrorist purposes and a longer list of reasonable excuses. And finally, these two clauses, 3b and 3c, that the Secretary of State should issue guidance about what constitutes a reasonable excuse. I hate to tell you this if you view the House of Lords as some expert superior chamber, but I found in making this video the political appointees, who are all former local councillors and party officials, are the only ones who propose amendments, and the only time the crossbench experts speak is to point out just what steaming turds some of those amendments are. When referring to the highlighted Amendment 3b, the former Lord Chief Justice, Lord Judge, rose to say, The final point, and I find this extremely alarming, is the idea that a Secretary of State, using executive powers, should issue guidance about how the law should be implemented. <coughs> Either the law is clear, or it is not. Mm. Guidance doesn't make it any clearer. And it gives an enormous power, I think probably for the first time in criminal justice legislation, to enable the Secretary of State to say, this may not come within the ambit of the offence, this may, and so on and so forth. And it is done without any parliamentary control. And that really should not happen. My Lords, um, I uh, rise to support the amendments in this group, although I have some reservations uh, about all of them now that the noble Lord Lord Judge has uh, spoken. Uh, yeah, I bet you do have some reservations about those amendments. But exactly as occurred at the Commons Committee stage, when it comes to the end of the debate... I, I will reflect on all responses and the comments heard, and uh, in particular the very wise comments from the noble Lord Lord Judge. And I also thought that those comments, of course, would be very interesting in terms of the status of guidance, are actually very interesting in terms of other legislation for the House that the government would take a very contrary view to, which would be interesting to discuss that in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, but anyway, at this stage, I beg leave to withdraw the amendment. With all of the opposition amendments on Clause 3 withdrawn, we can now proceed to the Lord's report stage, where, as in the Commons, the government has tabled some amendments to Clause 3. The government amendments are to explicitly include academic research and journalism as examples of the reasonable excuse defence, a suggestion that originated back in the Commons Bill Committee, and this amendment passes unopposed. In the Lords, third reading does allow individual amendments, though they tend to be immaterial, and there was no change on Clause 3. And with that, the bill has now finished its journey in the House of Lords, gets tied in a red ribbon, and walked back through Central Lobby the other way to be presented back at the House of Commons. <laughs> Now we enter the home straight for creating an Act of Parliament, whether the Commons are going to agree with the amendments proposed by the Lords. This process can go backwards and forwards, called ping-pong, when each House amends and amends and amends until they find a wording of a clause that they can both agree on. However, in the case of this bill, the Commons accepted all of the Lords' amendments because they were proposed by the Government Lords anyway, and in the case of Clause 3... In committee, the Honourable Member for Torfen argued for greater certainty for those who might have legitimate reason for accessing terrorist material. The Government has previously offered assurances that those legitimately engaged in journalism or academic research would be covered by the reasonable excuse defence. However, to provide further reassurance, Lord Amendment 1, Lord's Amendment 1 makes this explicit on the face of Section 58. And with no divisions left to call, no more debate to be had, there's nothing left to do but conclude the debate 
with a nice parliamentary group hug. I am grateful to their noble lords for improving the bill. Uh, I'm grateful to Her Majesty's opposition and indeed the Liberal Democrats and the SNP for their changes uh, uh, around the bill. And therefore we have a bill that I think truly will help bring uh, people together and deliver a better security. I'd like to, uh, my thanks to the Honourable Member for Torvine and for him putting up with my struggling pronunciation of his seat. I hope I've got it right. Uh, my Welsh is very, very poor. The right Honourable Member for Kingston Surbiton, Paisley in Renfrewshire, the Honourable Member for Baron Furness for his very helpful suggestion to campaigning around the designated areas. He is part of the inspiration for it, so he can carry the blame for it if it doesn't work in a, in a few years' time. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'll be taking some of the blame, so we can hear. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Honourable Member for Reddit, who has uh, uh, gallantly PPS through the committee, uh, our usual channel, the uh, Honourable Member for Blackpool North, uh, and I would like to thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and all the speakers for steering this bill through the House. Thank you very much. And that is it. Both Houses have agreed on the text of the bill, all that's left is to send it off to the palace, Lizzie to whip out the biro, smear some ink, and on the 12th of February 2019, eight months after we embarked on this journey, the Lord Speaker announces... Her Majesty the Queen has signified her royal assent to the following acts. Finance Act, Voyeurism Offences Act, Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Act, Tenant Fees Act, Crime Overseas Production Orders Act. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. I focused on one particular clause, but imagine that process occurring for every other clause. Imagine the work that goes into a bill that might have 200 or more technical and specialist clauses. And this wasn't a particularly contentious bill. The bill process was far more collaborative and less confrontational than you'll find with other Acts of Parliament. And even with this, there was still a lot that I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about the whips and the whipping process. You may have realised all of those votes were scripted in advance between the parties. I didn't include the civil servant behind many of those decisions, the most powerful name in Parliament who you have never heard. And my personal favourite, Parliament's biggest legislative mistake when they repealed a clause without looking closely enough and broke the ability of courts to sentence repeat offenders to prison time, which was only discovered seven years after it occurred. So I'll probably make a few short videos on those topics in the future, but for now, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to like, subscribe, or just watch some of my other videos, and I'll see you next time.